Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we're going to talk about where and why factories decide to locate where they do. We looked at the primary sector location theory last unit when we talked about Von Thunen's model of agricultural land use. The secondary sector's location theory, or the theory about where factories choose to locate, is called the least cost theory, which is a model developed by Alfred Weber, according to which the location of manufacturing establishments is determined by the minimization of three critical expenses, labor, transportation, and agglomeration. In other words, businesses weigh the cost of labor, the cost of transportation, and the benefits of agglomeration to determine where to locate a factory. And the primary focus, as the name implies, is to keep product costs as low as possible in order to maximize profits. So tonight, we will examine each of these three costs, as well as a few others that factory owners would consider. Let's start with the last one, because it requires us to define the term. Agglomeration is a process of the clustering or concentrating of people or activities. The term often refers to manufacturing plants and businesses that benefit from close proximity because they share skilled labor pools and technological and financial amenities. Agglomeration can make a location more attractive for a company potentially overcoming higher transportation or labor costs. By clustering together, industries can assist each other through shared talents, services, and facilities. For example, the automobile industry clustered in and around Detroit. This drew skilled labor to the city, as well as manufacturers of component parts. This in turn drew other car companies to the same area to help them minimize their costs, eventually leading to the name Motor City being assigned to Detroit. So as it relates to the least cost theory, agglomeration is a good thing that can help reduce inefficiencies, thereby saving money and increasing profit margins. Weber's least cost theory was based on the assumption that a factory would need two raw material inputs that would be processed into a finished good and shipped out to just a single market point. To Weber, the most important cost was transportation. Fuel and shipping costs are heavily contingent on the weight of the goods and how far they are being transported. So heavy or bulky items are more expensive to ship, which is a good example of the friction of distance. And raw materials either gain or lose weight as they're processed into a finished good. And this weight change would dictate the ideal location of the factory, according to Weber. So bulk reducing industries are industries in which the final product weighs less or comprises a lower volume than the inputs. These are also called weight losing industries, raw material oriented industries, or raw material dependent industries. In an industry where the raw materials are heavier or larger, the factory is likely to be located near the raw materials because that will shorten the distance the heavier object must be transported. So a coal burning power plant relies on a raw material that loses weight by being processed. The coal is burned and emitted as smoke and carbon dioxide. Therefore, a coal burning power plant would likely locate near a coal pit rather than near the market that consumes the electricity. Other localized raw materials, that is those that are found in a very specific place, include iron ore, bauxite, and lumber, and their processing plants tend to locate nearby. On the other hand, there are bulk gaining industries, which are industries in which 
the final product weighs more or comprises a greater volume than the inputs. These are also called weight gaining industries, market oriented industries, or market dependent industries. An industry where the final product weighs more or becomes larger in size will locate the factory closer to the market to try and keep transportation costs as low as possible. Automobile manufacturing is a good example because the component parts of a car, say the bumper, the windshield, and the steering wheel, weigh less individually than the finished car. So generally, the factory will locate nearest the heavier part of production, but it does get more complicated. If a finished product is more perishable or time sensitive than the raw materials, as with baked goods or local newspapers, a location near the market is required. But if the product is more fragile than the raw materials, such as with glass items, the industry will also be attracted to locations near the market. As we established previously, if there is an increase in weight or bulk, perishability or fragility, transportation costs of the finished product will be higher than those of the raw materials. On the other hand, if the inputs are more perishable, as with fresh fruit before it's canned or frozen, then the factory will locate near the inputs. Just remember that the name of the least cost theory tells you what you need to know. If you're a factory owner, where will you place your factory? It is the place where you generate the greatest profit by minimizing expenses or paying the least costs. When Weber was writing, transportation costs accounted for upwards of 50% of the total cost of a good. Today, transportation costs account for less than 5% of the cost of a good. So we need to discuss reasons for that decline. Improvements in infrastructure, that is the basic physical and organizational structures and facilities, such as buildings, roads, and public utilities needed for the operation of a society, have led to declining transportation costs. The development of rail and road infrastructure, as well as the use of airplanes, ships, and super tankers, have greatly reduced the costs of shipping raw materials and finished products around the world. This is part of space-time compression that we discussed back in Chapter 1. In addition, we've seen the clustering of transportation infrastructure into what we call break of bulk points, which are locations where transfer is possible from one mode of transportation to another. So the transfer of cargo from ships to trucks occurs at a break of bulk point. These are typically ports, but also airports, railway stations, and other waterways like canals. If a factory were to locate at a break of bulk point, transportation efficiency increases, the total cost declines, meaning profits will increase. The Los Angeles port is a great example of a break of bulk point. It is the busiest port in the United States and shipping containers can quickly be transferred from massive container ships to individual trucks and trains to be shipped inland using the established infrastructure. So let's talk for a moment about the current system of containerization. Before standard sized shipping containers, a ship would arrive at port with various odd sized crates and boxes and hundreds of dock workers would be needed to unload the goods by hand. The container system created standard sized metal containers, which can contain any variety of finished product or raw good. These containers are loaded, stacked, and unloaded by special mechanized cranes at break of bulk points and can be placed on trucks, 
boats, and railway cars. In fact, 90% of the world's non-bulk cargo is transported via containers. This development lowered costs and increased flexibility for manufacturers who can now focus on reducing other costs, like labor. Transportation costs, while significant, are less important today than other production costs like labor. So let's examine how labor costs influence factory location. Labor intensive industries are industries for which labor costs comprise a high percentage of total expenses. Higher labor costs tend to reduce the margin of profit. So a factory farther away from raw materials and markets might do better if cheap labor compensates for the higher transportation costs. But it depends on the industry. Certain technologies, such as computers, cameras, and watches, require very skilled or highly educated laborers, which will generally have higher labor costs. So companies like the high-tech companies of Silicon Valley will often locate close to college or universities or other training institutions. But mass-produced goods may not need the same skill or education. As a result, many companies have sought to locate their manufacturing plants in areas with relatively low wages. These tend to be peripheral areas with low education levels and high rates of unemployment. For example, the U.S. textile industry moved from New England to the lower wage South, where labor unions were not as powerful. More recently, companies have shifted their production to other countries with even lower wage workers, countries like China, Bangladesh, Vietnam, India, Indonesia, and Cambodia. The same phenomenon has occurred with automobile manufacturing. While automobiles had clustered in Detroit to maximize efficiency, wages eventually reached a level that the factory owners decided to close them and move manufacturing south. Other factories opened in Mexico and other low-wage countries. But there are other considerations that factory owners will make as well. Modern factories are likely to locate on the periphery of urban areas in the suburbs to benefit from cheaper land costs. Energy dependent manufacturing, like aluminum, often locates near hydroelectric plants to benefit from abundant energy resources. Other industries might look for locations with fewer environmental regulations that could raise the cost of production. To simplify this as much as possible, a factory owner may make their decision in stages. They'll likely start by finding a location with the lowest transportation costs when it comes to importing raw materials and exporting a finished product. But they may adjust this location based on labor, land, and energy costs, while seeking to maximize the efficiencies of agglomeration. These factors are likely to pull a factory location to a different site. And we will explore this more when we come back to class. Have a good evening, everyone.